Good evening, everyone. We are so pleased that you could join us for this discussion on managing pain. Uh, before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this is the meeting, this meeting place is still the home of many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. My name is Rachel Bosma. I'm situated at the Faculty of Dentistry at the University of Toronto, and I'm one of the co-directors of the University of Toronto Center for the Study of Pain. So that's a mouthful. We're gonna to refer to it as the UTCSP, but that's what it refers to. Uh, my research program is actually embedded at the Toronto Academic Pain Medicine Institute at Women's College Hospital, where I trial innovative solutions in virtual healthcare interventions with a focus on chronic pain. I'm pleased to be your host this evening. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, this webinar is offered in collaboration with the UTCSP. And so a little bit about the UTCSP is a dedicated center at the University of Toronto. It involves the faculties of dentistry, medicine, nursing, and pharmacy. And so we're all working together to understand the mechanisms of pain and how we can treat it better. Uh, because pain is complex. Solving the pain puzzle, it requires to, us to understand everything all the way, if you think about it from the genetic code all the way to the postal code. That's a lot of material to cover. So it takes a village, it takes all of us to come together. And at the UTCSP, we bring together partners, not only from across the faculties of the university, but also across our nine fully affiliated hospitals and many community partners. I am joined this evening by colleagues from each of the four faculties. Uh, so I'll take a time to introduce each one of them now. So from the Leslie Van Faculty of Pharmacy and my co-director of the UTCSP, I'd like to welcome Dr. Rob Bonin. So Rob is a preclinical scientist. There he's waving at you. He's a preclinical scientist. He has developed new approaches that actually allow us to study specific pain pathways. So he and his team are aiming to identify potential drug targets to address the source of pain and also to help pave the way for development of new treatments that are more effective for chronic pain. So welcome, Rob. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. From the Temerty Faculty of Medicine, we welcome Dr. Abhi Sood. Dr. Sood is the director for the award-winning course, Safe Opioid Prescribing at the University of Toronto. He's also a very active public advocate regarding the opioid crisis. So he works on the clinical front lines. He provides care as a community-based family doctor, um, but he's interested in research as well. And his research interests also explore the interconnection between chronic pain and mental health and how interventions on chronic pain can actually be used to alleviate depressive symptoms. So welcome, Abhi. Thanks for being here. Real pleasure. Good evening, everyone. From the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing, please welcome Monica Perry. Dr. Perry is an associate professor whose research program focuses on reducing the burden of cardiovascular disease and its complications. She's interested in patient-oriented research and sex and gender influences on health and well-being. So we're gonna have to ask her a lot about that. Um, Monica is currently leading our research team to develop and test the tailored digital health innovation for women with cardiac pain. And she actually continues to practice as a nurse practitioner in cardiac surgery. So welcome, Monica. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I'm so excited about the opportunity to discuss what I think is such an important topic. I anticipate us having a really rich conversation. So I just wanted to say a final thanks to the panelists for being here and thank you to the audience for joining us. Uh, before we dive in, I encourage you in the audience, um, we want your participation. Please send your questions via the chat function and we're going to leave time at the end. We'll sift through them and we'll address as many as we can because we want to discuss the things that are of interest to you. Uh, this session will be recorded. Uh, and you will get the link after the session will, will be sent out to you. And so you can watch it on demand anytime you would like. All right, so let's get started. So I think it's fair to say that most of us understand what pain feels like. Most of us know what it feels like when we burn our hand on a stove or when we stub our toe. 
Um, but we don't all experience pain the same way or for the same reasons or with the same intensity. And unfortunately though, all too many of us knows what it feels like to have pain that will not go away. And when we look at the statistics, one in five Canadians have chronic pain, one in five. And so if you were to work, look around this virtual room, we currently have over 600 participants join us. Um, a good number of us could be suffering from the debilitating physical, emotional, social, and economic impacts of chronic pain. But what causes pain? Why does it persist? What is the impact? And what are some of the solutions? So these are some of the ideas that we're excited to talk about tonight. So let's kick us off. Let's talk, start by talking about why. Why do people feel pain? How do people feel pain? Uh, so to reach out to our panelists, Rob, I'm gonna pick on you first. I'm curious because you're in a preclinical setting, uh, working kind of on the mechanisms of pain. From your perspective, how does it work? How does pain work? How is this sensation produced in our bodies? Hey, uh, thanks for that question. It's, it is a very big question. Um, and it's big in part because of what you're alluding to that we all know what pain is, but of course we all have different um, understanding, different experiences of what pain actually is to us individually. At sort of the biological level though, there are some pretty standard um, aspects of the actual pain sensation itself. So if we take an example such as pricking your finger. So if I prick my finger now, it's going to activate specialized sensory nerves um, that respond to that sort of pricking sensation or damage or injury. It's going to send us, these nerves are going to send a signal along my arm and eventually into my spinal cord, where they're going to activate then another subset of cells in the spinal cord, which will process that signal. And some of those cells will then project that sensory information up to the brain. And it's important actually at this point, we're not talking about pain. This is all just sensory processing. Um, this is just stimulus transmitted up to the brain. It's when we have the diverse act, the activation of diverse networks within the brain, do we actually begin to recapitulate or have that full pain experience? Um, this has actually been named by one of our members, uh, Karen Davis, as the pain connectome or the dynamic pain connectome, because this is actually, there's a lot of regions in the brain that work together to create the overall experience. It's not just sensory, it's emotional. Um, it can be motivational, right? Pain is, uh, it's a motivational signal. It drives us to change our behavior. So this is why when we talk about pain, it's best referred to as an emotional experience, not just simply a sensory one. Um, but of course, looking into the biology of this as a basic scientist, this is what we are trying to understand. What are the individual differences or parameters that begin to converge together to create the unique experience of pain? Not just the sensory transduction, but how does it all um, begin to work together. So beyond biology, of course, there's a lot of individual factors, um, genetics, social and socioeconomic factors, previous experience with pain, age, um, and so on. So it, there are a lot of factors that go together to what pain is, uh, as alluded to, but we are beginning to understand at least at a biolog biological level how this um, is processed. Thanks, Rob. So you commented on something that I want to reflect a little bit and dive a little bit deeper into. And you said, you know, pain is a unique experience. So pricking your finger does not result in the same experience in, in every individual. And one of our audience members actually asked the question, you know, are there differences in the pain experience, pain levels, pain intensity? Um, and are these differences related to sex? So whether you're male or female, um, and if so, how is pain being managed or can it be tailored uh, to address these differences? So Monica, because you work in that space of sex and gender and you work with individual patients, uh, do they all experience pain in the same way? And if not, are there different approaches to, to treating individuals? Thanks, Rachel. And thanks, Rob, for the discussion about the biology of pain. I think most of us likely understand the nature of pain is complex. It's dynamic, as, as Rob mentioned, and it is multidimensional. It's also subjective and very personal. This means that people do experience pain um, differently. And Rob alluded to the biological or the disease or the mechanism of injury and the psychosocial components of pain, which are the emotive aspects such as anxiety. Emotions can trigger or amplify our pain experiences and they can play a part in the development of chronic pain. 
Compared to men, women have been found to have more pain after surgery. And in my experience, I work with people after having a bypass surgery. And more women have more chronic pain, such as pain of arthritis and fibromyalgia. So these differences could be due to the biology. So women have greater pain sensitivities and variable responses to pain medication compared to men. But I think it's also likely related to the interrelationship between anxiety and depression as Rob alluded to, which are also more common in women. There are differences in expectations about the experiences of pain, fear, attention, distraction. And I think there's also cultural differences in pain in terms of pain expression, pain language, and pain management strategies that make the pain experience different for different people. I wanna highlight something though, not just the sex differences, but talk a little bit about the gendered factors that influence pain. For example, individuals who believe they're more masculine actually experience pain differently than those who believe they're more feminine. We also know there are age-related differences for pain. Um, for example, back pain is more common in 30 to 50 year olds. So the pain experience is uh, dynamic, it is complex. And uh, Rob alluded to the socioeconomic factors such as education, income, which are also gendered aspects um, of care that influence the pain experience. So there are differences between men and women and it is more complex than just sex differences. I think it also entails uh, the gender differences between uh, men and women, not just males and females. Thank you, Monica. If I could just build on that a little bit. Um... Uh, from the clinical side, I'm more on the postal code side rather than the genetic code side. And uh, to add on, besides in, in terms of how people uh, experience and present with pain, there are also important gender differences as well as cultural differences in how we treat pain. Uh, you know, for, for, as a simple example, for example, we know that we treat, uh, we provide higher doses and more frequent doses of opioids for women who have pain, as well as higher doses of benzodiazepines, which are actually not um, uh, pain medications, but uh, typically used to treat anxiety for women who are experiencing pain as compared to men. Thank you all. So we've, we've got this sense that it's a very complex picture. And then when you have the individual sitting in front of you um, and you're trying to help them manage and support them in the management of their pain, you've got to recognize that it's unique to them, that it's a personal experience and that there's all these factors that you've all alluded to, whether it's sex and gender or cultural or past experience or your, um, your emotional components of pain. Um, so I, I'm curious a little bit about the pain itself. So Rob mentioned kind of like the prick of the finger. So I was thinking, you know, if I burn my hand on the stove, how is that different? Um, compared to someone, or is that different compared to someone who's experiencing chronic pain? Is all pain the same? I can jump in on this one a bit. Um, so I think that's an excellent question, um, that there are, there are in some ways strong similarities and in some ways strong differences between the types of pain that are experienced um, in the acute and chronic cases. Um, both of these can have impacts on individuals. Uh, to stick maybe a bit with the acute side, just for a second. Um, so you mentioned a prick in the finger. So a prick in the finger can sometimes feel just like a prick in the finger, and other times it can actually have a much larger emotional response. Um, and what I'm referring to here would be, say, as a jab of a vaccine. So again, it's a prick. It's not a very necessarily very strong noxious stimulus, but it can evoke a very strong emotional response. Um, and because of that especially young children that have uh, vaccinations can begin to develop a fear of vaccines and vaccine hesitancy. So this is, and I bring this up because it's something that we're trying to address on both sides. So not only the experience of pain in the acute and the chronic, but as well, the overall impact that it may have on the individual. And just sticking with vaccine hesitancy, there's actually been some uh, quite remarkable work actually being done by Anna Tadio here at the University of Toronto showing different ways to reduce fear and pain during vaccinations. And this 
um, the overall goal of this is to reduce vaccine hesitancy. Um, up to 20% of people actually have fear of vaccines because of the pain and the overall experience associated with it. So it's, it's very valuable to, when we're looking at pain management, as you were implying, to look at the experience of pain um, across different settings, so both acute to chronic. So I guess coming back now more to the chronic state, um, if I were to use yet another example uh, to think about um, persistent post-surgical pain. So persistent post-surgical pain can occur in up to 50% of patients after surgery and in 10% of the patients, it can actually be quite severe. Uh, the pain can be described as burning, shooting. It's a very, very salient experience. It can be a very debilitating form of pain. Um, so this can actually occur because during the surgery, sensory nerves can actually get damaged. And when those nerves are damaged, it can initiate a cascade of events. So, so we have inflammation of nerves, we have changes in the function or the activity and the connectivity of cells, say in the spinal cord, in the brain. And these changes can actually persist for a long time after the surgical site is healed. So these types of injuries, whether you have just an acute noxious sensation, such as a prick, which will transiently activate a set of nerves, as opposed to say, chronic condition where you have inflammation or changes in the, along the actual whole pain axis um, that we've been talking about can have different, can produce different sensations of pain. Now, probably one of the most frustrating aspects of uh, post-surgical pain is that we know exactly when the surgery is going to be done. Or usually we know when the surgery is going to be done. We usually know exactly what we're going to do, but there's very little we can actually do to prevent the post-surgical pain. So, I mean, we are making efforts to manage post-surgical pain in terms of doing, um, having less invasive surgeries, different types of anesthetics, more regional nerve blocks, for example, administering different drugs to prevent the inflammation or those changes in connectivity uh, and so on. Might I jump in here? I think, Rob, you're making a good point. Um, I think the inherent nature of the pain experience as subjective and multidimensional really does add complexity to our pain management strategies. And we really can't have a one size fits all approach. Um, I think it's important, as you mentioned, to prevent the transition from acute to chronic pain. And so I think we need to devote some of our attention and energies to the, to the management of chronic pain, as you suggest. And that includes increasing our knowledge about pain, our pain management strategies, and really attending to those emotive aspects. You mentioned fear before surgery. So addressing some of those psychosocial aspects of the pain experience. I also think we need to be sort of attuned to the cultural differences, you know, in terms of pain assessment and are we assessing pain appropriately so we can manage it appropriately across different, um, you know, racialized groups, et cetera. So I guess I would just like to conclude and highlight that once those chronic pain pathways are established or the memory set, as you say, um, you know, people are on that path to chronic pain. So I think we need to take a step back and focus on that acute pain experience and what we can do there for people. Yeah, I completely agree. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Rob. I mean, I'm going to kind of switch over to you for a second and pick your brain a little bit. So Rob commented on a couple um, key features in, in terms of, you know, surgical pain. We know when uh, individuals are going in and, and he commented on risk factors. And I'm just thinking, you know, as a community um, practitioner, when you have the individual patient in front of you, how do you explain this to them? What are some of those risk factors that they might face in terms of the development of chronic and what are some, you know, maybe mitigation strategies or, or strategies that they can use to actually improve outcomes? Thanks, Rachel. That's a great question. Um, so I, um, before I, as a, as a clinician, before I uh, explain anything about chronic pain, my uh, first step is to allow uh, a patient, a patient in front of me to explain their experience because it is uh, so specific and so unique. Uh, of course, there are patterns across patients that we look to identify uh, and help guide us in terms of management. But uh, I, I think one way to capture sort of how I think about uh, how and why we should be treating chronic pain is that I, I don't think it's so much pain that brings people uh, to see me as a clinician or see other 
uh, clinicians who have expertise in chronic pain. Uh, it's really when we sort of cross a threshold from pain into suffering. Uh, when people begin to have difficulty, be because pain is so common um, and so, uh, so much a part of daily life, it's really when we sort of cross that threshold, when we have difficulty uh, coping, difficulty understanding what's happening with our, our body, our minds, our emotions, our spirit even, um, that we go to seek help um, fr from clinicians. And so being able to allow people to explain that experience, uh, I think as clinicians helps us reorient ourselves towards uh, what our goals are, because uh, we have been uh, traditionally as um, uh, health clinicians been very focused on uh, pain reduction or pain elimination. And that can be very challenging uh, and, and can lead to many problems. I, I would very much argue that that has been the uh, uh, important contributor to our opioid crisis. Uh, this idea that we can really eliminate pain. Um, uh, but if our orientation is more towards uh, the reduction of suffering, uh, there's a lot that we can do and our, our, our approach and our, uh, uh, our whole clinical encounter and how we care for people over time uh, really begins to change. And that has to do with, we talk a lot about uh, personalized medicine and uh, there, there are certainly uh, approaches in personalized medicine that come from the you know, deep bio, bio, biomedical, biochemical um, uh, tailored approaches to certain kinds of pain. And there also per, there's personalized medicine that comes from you know, understanding the person in front of you uh, and their peculiar particular uh, uh, experience of pain and tailoring treatments to them. Because we have actually a lot to offer people uh, in terms of managing their pain, uh, whether that's medications, uh, cognitive therapies, physical therapies, uh, acupuncture, meditation. Uh, and it can actually, you know, obviously uh, many people who come to us have done a lot of their own research, uh, which is wonderful. And uh, what we can do is help sort of guide and understand, you know, what are the appropriate interventions for that person at that time, and really try and tailor it to what they can, um, uh, what they can, uh, what they're able to access at that time. I'm going to follow up on that and and ask you a little bit more. You you mentioned how important it is to really focus on what the person in front of you is saying about their pain and letting them explain their pain. And if you could just comment a little bit on how do we, how do we, or maybe how should we um, go about capturing this really complex experience. And I'm thinking it's specifically from, you know, as scientists, we like to measure everything. We like to have the tools and we like objective measurements. Can you comment from a clinical perspective on, on how to capture this and, and really listen to the, the person in front of you? Yes, it, uh, that, that's a great question. In, in, in many ways, uh, chronic pain can um, defy our typical uh, clinical medical approach to uh, assessment and management because pain is um, in its nature uh, and there's no way around pain is subjective. Uh, we do not have a, a painometer. Um, uh, there is very poor correlation in many cases between, uh, for example, imaging, even you know, very uh, sophisticated, high quality imaging of uh, MRIs or uh, CT scans. There can be very poor correlation between what we see on imaging and uh, how somebody actually experiences and presents with pain. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't do good assessments in pain. Uh, we can actually do very, very good assessments that give us a very good sense of uh, what the pain condition is like and what appropriate treatments are. And those go back to the very basics of uh, clinical medicine, which is taking a good history and doing a very good detailed physical examination. Uh, uh, for the vast majority of people whom I see, that gives me uh, more than enough information to be able to make a diagnosis and make good recommendations for pain management. Of course, you know, when merited, there are investigations that can be done. Uh, but, the, but the challenge, of course, is um, setting up our clinical practice and our environment in such a way that we have the time and space to be able to offer that um, a really detailed, thorough assessment for our patients. I do want to follow up on this maybe before we um, jump on, but Abby, if I could just ask one more question. When you say we, you can, the diagnosis can be done, um, 
how do you monitor progress with this? Like, do, do, can we use the same tools? Are they as effective? Yeah, I mean, even though uh, we don't have, for example, an objective measure of pain or objective measure of function, we can still measure it. You know, you, you can still have subjective measures. Uh, so, you know, there are all kinds of tools, for example, the brief pain inventory that give us uh, measures of uh, somebody's current state of pain, their worst pain, their best pain, what their function is like, and we can use that uh, to, to track their response to treatment over time. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I think that this is really touching on a very important topic about how we're actually able to assess pain over time and that, you know, we just don't have something that we can objectively use. But in the end, maybe the most objective thing we have is the patient themselves, pain being an experience. We ask them and if they say their pain is what they say it is. So I think that, you know, in some ways it may seem less objective. In other ways, it's maybe the more accurate that we have. Um, but I just wanted to jump in because there was two ideas uh, that you mentioned that made me think about um, you mentioned we do have many treatments, which is correct. Um, you also briefly touched on the opioid crisis. And I think that this highlights um, a couple of ideas. One, um, that maybe we don't actually have that many effective treatments because we have, um, because opioids are basically one of the mainstays that we have. Um, on the other hand, it does raise another point that we haven't drug development in a way for pain has been at a standstill for a long time. If we think about the drugs that we have, opioids have been around for thousands of years, you know, morphine has been around for hundreds, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs have been around for over a hundred years. Other mainstay drugs, we have anticonvulsants, antidepressants, they clearly weren't developed for pain treatment, but they are efficacious in some cases. So, I mean, among these, there's not really there's obviously no magic bullet. And this is something I think that we're trying to as a community to continue to work forward to. But there's another old drug been around for thousands of years as well that's been uh, increasingly used as cannabis. So we know that a lot more people are using cannabis now in part because of its availability in part because of awareness for treatment of pain, um, which is great yeah, if it works for the patients. But on the other hand, there's actually it's it's a largely an anecdotal movement, I would say. I mean, there's not a lot of strong, high quality evidence showing which conditions cannabis can be best be used for. And it's not, um, I mean, it's a couple of reasons for this. One, federal governments have not been motivated to show beneficial effects of cannabis for a very long time. Um, two, on the other hand, there's just been so much variability in cannabis that's been available, right? It hasn't necessarily been produced in a very rigorous manner. And so it, this is not to say that cannabis is not good for pain, it's just saying that we're not entirely sure about how it actually can be used within the repertoire, which is why I think it's amazing that there are actually some fantastic studies um, being initiated here at the University of Toronto. Um, very recently, actually, uh, one of our members, um, Hans Clark, uh, kicked off a very large study to look at the first of its kind um, investigation into real world effects of pain, of cannabis and pain using standardized um, products. So it's a registered study. Patients can select, for example, from which product they want to use. It's standardized in terms of CBD, THC. I mean, there's still debate about which people, which if there's a combination or which one's actually better um, for different pain conditions. And they can track to see whether that exact product has the same effects over time. And I think this is essential. I mean, I think this is really showing a way forward in terms of how we move forward with standardized ways, how we're able to combine now, look a bit more broadly beyond the tools that we have. Thanks, Rob. I'm just going to jump in and say this is maybe an opportunity that the topic for tonight is managing pain. And so maybe we should explore this a little bit more in terms of what are our current state of the art? What, where are we in terms of pain management strategies now? And so Rob has talked a little bit about the pharmacological, the, like the pharmaceutical approaches and where we are on cannabis and, and where we want to be and where we're going to be soon um, with the research kind of catching up. Uh, we talked a little bit about opioids, but what else is on the table when it comes to pain management strategies? And maybe I'll just uh, ask Monica to give kind of her insights in terms of the current uh, strategies available. 
I can discuss some of the non-pharmacologic strategies. And I would categorize these as physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental strategies. And I can get into more detail if need be. Um, some of our work, and some of this includes uh, Clark as well, um, we parceled these strategies into a self-management program. And self-management programs really allow individuals to take an active part in the management of their own condition, like pain. Um, they uh, help individuals reduce their pain. They um, help uh, improve health-related quality of life as well. And I would highlight that the sex, i.e. the biological as well as the gender, gender socio-cultural differences in pain um, are attended to in these self-management strategies. So in our digital tailored um, health intervention, we call it at heart, it is geared for women who have cardiac pain. And we focus on the self-management of cardiac pain by using an interactive chat bot and a progressive web app. Um, these are technologies designed to reach women anywhere in Canada on any kind of device. Um, so mobile devices and laptops. The chatbot manages pain content and conversations using a heart check, which is really a pain assessment. It uses a wellness check, and that is based on the brief pain inventory that was mentioned. Um, and it assesses pain interference in general activity, walking, work, mood, enjoyment of life, relations with other people, and sleep. And within this progressive web app, there's a, a library. And so the heart check helps women recognize their pain symptoms, make decisions about whether their pain is acute or chronic. We talked about that, you know, is, is the pain um, relevant enough to bring you to the emergency room, for example. Um, the chatbot also uses the wellness check to provide tailored readings and self-management advice from the library on pain. Um, another, I think, unique feature of these self-management programs is we can use technologies, S SMS and MMS push notifications, which they stand for short message services and multimedia messaging services. So text messages, we can push out videos and photos and audio links to coach women or coach people in managing their pain, which I, which I think is something sort of on, on, on the forefront of some of these technologies. Um, so patient-centered tailored coaching strategies actually empower patients or empower people to self-manage their pain. They, we can integrate education about pain, assessment and management into these strategies. And so what we've done is parcel this into this progressive web app. So that's just one example. Thanks so much, Monica. You're, you're commenting on the fact that, you know, we've, we talked about how pain is so complex and how it really includes a biological or a physiological aspect, you know, the, the pain processing itself, um, but it includes a psychological aspect and a sociological aspect. And so it's no surprise to me that we need to take a more holistic approach to pain management and include these different strategies, both, you know, including pharmaceuticals and non-pharmaceuticals. And Abby, I'm wondering if you can just expand on that a little bit in terms of your um, pain management strategies when it comes to the person in front of you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll build on both uh, the great comments from Rob and Monica here. Uh, you know, Rob really touched on um, a innovation gap and in sort of the discovery gap and sort of the identifying uh, new molecules that can be used to uh, help treat pain. And that's a really important area of research uh, in pain and particularly at the university. Um, and, but th there's also uh, an implementation gap of making the stuff that we know already is effective, making it available and accessible pe to people who can, who can access it. And uh, that's sort of, sort of the side of the spectrum that I, my, my research is focused in. So for example, uh, you know, one trial which I'm leading right now is investigating meditation as an intervention for helping to improve depression in chronic pain. Uh, you know, we have already good evidence that meditation is effective for improving chronic pain. We also have good evidence that meditation is effective for improving uh, depression. 
And both of these um, uh, disorders uh, happen very commonly together. So Rachel mentioned you know, about one in five adults in Canada live with chronic pain. And we estimate that about half of those people, so that means about 10% of the adult population in Canada lives with both chronic pain and depression. And people who have both of those disorders together are, uh, have much worse outcomes in terms of their pain. Their pain is worse. They're more likely to be prescribed higher doses of opioids. They're more likely to develop uh, uh, addiction to opioids. They're more likely to overdose, more likely to commit suicide. So this is a really important area, but we actually have very little studies and very little evidence about how to actually uh, uh, help people improve their depression uh, when they have chronic pain. Uh, and so this is where we sort of came up with this idea that, well, we have independent evidence uh, of uh, effectiveness for meditation uh, for both of these disorders. Why don't we try and make this available? Uh, because that's where the implementation gap is. We know that these, a lot of these things are effective. Another example is um, uh, different kinds of psychotherapy for improving uh, chronic pain. Uh, we know that these interventions are helpful, not just by operating on the mind, but they operate on our body as well. Uh, but there's a big problem in terms of access. Um, and so how do we make, how do we structure our healthcare system uh, to make these kinds of uh, um, uh, effective therapies more available to the people who need them? And that's really sort of the implementation gap when it's a whole, whole area of research uh, in and of itself. I mean, maybe you could follow up. Um, this is actually an, a question posed by our audience as well. So you're commenting there is evidence out there that non-pharmacological interventions are effectiveness. And so the question was, okay, if they're important for pain management, why don't I have access to them? Why aren't they broadly covered? Um, and maybe you can give a little bit of historical context on, on that from the health system perspective and maybe get, shed a little bit of a light on where we are going and where we need to go with this. So that, that's a that's a really really important question, and following that question uh, tells us a lot about our health system, and uh, perhaps how we need to shift our health system. You know, I, uh, th there are uh, no uh, g given the magnitude of the opioid crisis, um, it, it, it's hard to think about uh, there being sort of a silver lining. Um, um, and so I don't think that's quite the right phrase, but uh, I, I hope, so to put some context here, uh, in 2017, Statistics Canada reported for the first time that life expectancy in Canada uh, went flat. It didn't go up. Uh, that was the first time that happened since World War II. And the time before that was the Great Depression in the last hundred years that we've been collecting data. And this flattening of life expectancy was entirely attributable to opioid overdose deaths. And so a uh, huge magnitude of effect of the opioid crisis. And the origin of the crisis is very much in how we have cared uh, for people with pain. And so uh, my hope uh, and what I'm trying to encourage anybody who I encounter to do is uh, how do we need to be rethinking our healthcare system uh, uh, so that we don't uh, recreate uh, these, these same kinds of problems. And uh, uh, you know, um, the, the perspective that I have taken is that uh, when we look back, you know, and in fact, actually about, uh, and part of my research focuses on this, you know, sort of what were we doing 40 years ago and 30 years ago for the management of chronic pain? And we actually had at that point, a good body of evidence, which we had synthesized and implemented in practice to deliver uh, multimodal, multidisciplinary, interprofessionally de delivered uh, chronic pain management. So that meant teams of people from different professions coming together and working together to help people who are living with chronic pain. So that would mean as part of the same team or in a coordinate, coordinated way, having a physiotherapist, a psychologist, a nurse, um, some kind of physician, maybe a psychiatrist or physiatrist or family physician, uh, pharmacists, all working together to support uh, the treatment of people living with chronic pain. And we had that evidence and we had that way of practicing uh, even as early as uh, the early 1980s and mid-1980s. Uh, and uh, what happened was that we had 
uh, the rise of opioids as a sort of panacea or therapeutic. And that really displaced this idea, changed our thinking around chronic pain from uh, more of a sort of bio, what we call a biopsycho-spiritual approach, this holistic approach to a more biomedical approach. And we're starting to see in response to the mistakes that we have made as a healthcare system, a uh, re-understanding and re-appreciation of the importance of a biopsychosocial approach that entails uh, multimodal pain management. And we see that, for example, you, you know, the University of Toronto has been a leader in education around interprofessional care uh, for uh, managing chronic pain. Uh, but uh, it, it takes time uh, for the system to shift again. And it also needs everybody's efforts because it's not going to happen on its own. There are a lot of forces at play. Uh, you know, in some ways, it's, it's, it's easier to hope for that, um, that silver bullet, you know, maybe that. And there's still a lot of money. Uh, for example, National Institutes of Health have poured a lot of money in finding that quote unquote non addictive opioid. Uh, you know, that's not going to cross the blood brain barrier or is not going to be uh, not going to be addictive and, you know, wonderful if, if that would be if that, if that would be discovered, but it's still not going to be an answer. It's not going to be enough. We know enough about chronic pain that we do need this uh, multidisciplinary approach and we need people uh, both on the health system side and also from the uh, public and patient side advocating for more access uh, to these therapies that we know are effective. Thank you. And I just wanted to follow up and put a little kind of uh, ray of hope. As you said, this was an idea in terms of the multidisciplinary, multi-approach of pain uh, to managing chronic pain. And then we shifted into something else and we're slowly shifting back. And I just wanted um, to put forward that this is something that there is a lot of um, new movement. Um, I mentioned the Toronto Academic Pain Medicine Institute where I sit at Women's College Hospital. And so in 2015, the Ministry of Health um, recognized the need for comprehensive care for chronic pain management. And they invested heavily in this province across 18 different uh, chronic pain clinics um, in Ontario to provide access to this care. And so a little, little plug there, tapmepain.ca, there we go, um, where you can see, you can come to these chronic pain, you can get referred to these chronic pain clinics and you will have OHIP covered access to the types of therapies that Monica and Rob and Abhi have been talking about today. So I, I just wanted to say, like, I think it is shifting back and that's really exciting, but we're not there yet. It's not in community, it's not access for all, and it's a paradigm shift. And I think one other the thing that you touched on, which I'm excited about, is that the University of Toronto um, Center for the Study of Pain has really championed educating the next generation of clinicians to understand that this is how chronic pain needs to be managed and how to do it. And so we've developed this very innovative curriculum to bring together the, the health faculties every year um, for a focus on not only what is chronic pain and how is it managed, but how to do that together collaboratively. So two kind of exciting things that are moving us, I think, in the right direction. I want to circle back to um, one of the comments that was made earlier um, around, around pain being so prevalent um, and it being pain or, or suffering being one of the most common reasons for seeking health care. Um, and so just to throw some stats, because numbers are kind of fun, um, pain, pain complaints account for approximately 78% of hospital visits. So the consequences as we've been talking about today of uncontrolled pain or infinite. And when you look at what's going on in our healthcare landscape, and when you look at what's going on in our society, so many of these issues are related, they're pain issues, they're related to pain. So when you talk about you know, our aging population, a lot of them face chronic pain, mental health, the opioid crisis, vaccination hesitancy that Rob raised earlier, um, healthcare costs. So they're related to the management or mismanagement of pain. So I want to dive a little bit deeper into like the impact and talk about what's the impact of this to the individual and what's the impact of this to society. So, so maybe Monica, you can jump in and share from like the individual perspective when you have a patient in front of you, um, what, how, what's the impact of chronic pain on that individual? 
Sure. Um, I can share a personal story of a young woman impacted by cardiac pain. And this woman has both acute and chronic cardiac pain. So she, I think, is a good example. Um, she also has some risk factors for chronic pain. So I'll call her Sally, just to protect her identity. And Sally is a 30-year-old woman. She lives in rural uh, maritime, so rural Nova Scotia. She was a previous smoker, really didn't exercise too much. She ate a poor diet, and she has two children now. She was diagnosed with gestational diabetes during her second pregnancy, and she had a significant history of heart disease. Her mother had a heart attack in her 30s. Father had bypass surgery in her 40s. And unfortunately, Sally, being 30 years old, um, had her sister die of a heart attack at age 25. So she had many risk, sort of physical risk factors, and then she had these psychological risk factors. So I think there's a couple important things to highlight with this case study. Um, first, pain can affect anyone at any age, and we know that you know, we see infants with pain up to um, you know, older individuals with pain. And Sally's pain certainly had a direct impact on both her physical and her mental function and her health related quality of life. Um, it also had a direct and indirect effect on society. Um, Sally no longer works. She's supported by her husband and her family who have to live nearby to support the family unit. So she lives with chronic cardiac pain and she is a frequent user of our healthcare services as mentioned by um, Abby. She also, because of the ruralness of where she lives, has less access to specialized care, which is problematic. So she um, lives uh, with impaired function, depression. She has poor health related quality of life. And much like others who live with chronic pain, um, the economic burden I think of this chronic pain is significant. So she, I think, presents as an interesting case. And I'll just highlight one sort of emerging piece of evidence around um, chronic pain in young women. Um, there is evidence to suggest that depressive symptoms are linked with pain and heart disease in women that are under 55 years of age, but not associated with pain or heart disease in men or women over 55 years of age. So it's interesting. So that I think just speaks to the complexity of pain, age differences, and the one size fits all won't work. Um, so the other unique thing for Sally is she lives with chronic pain, but she has flares of acute pain. And this might be relevant to others living with chronic pain. How do you tell when your pain becomes acute? How do you differentiate that from the chronicity of your pain and when, when you should seek sort of uh, further advice or assessment in a healthcare facility. So she's, that's just one example of uh, a young woman living with chronic uh, cardiac pain. Thanks, because I, I think it really, that example really highlights that it, it impacts the individual, but it impacts every aspect of their life and those around them. And I think not forgetting that it, it impacts caregivers and then also who, you know, people who are caregivers, you mentioned her children and the impact that that has and, and how um, that's really shifted in her, her role and, and the, the role that she takes in the family dynamics. So I think we can see from that example, like the huge impact that this has. It's not just a, you know, one thing that she has to deal with on the side, but it really permeates um, across her life. Um, sure. Thinking about it kind of moving from the, the individual experience back to society um, and the impact on society, um, I mean, you, you touched on this a little bit, and I want to just circle back and get you to expand on, on the, the impact to society, but also focus that you mentioned earlier, which I think is striking, um, this idea of this plateau in life expectancy and, and so relationship to to um, the opioid crisis. And, and some of our audience members actually pose the question, are we seeing an increase in suffering from past generations? Or is there more pain today than there was? And, and are we seeing increases or what is the impact of the pandemic on those with chronic pain? Is it increasing or exacerbating chronic pain? 
Um, so maybe Abby, you can start, and if anybody else wants to jump in with their experiences of managing pain over over the pandemic, it would be great to hear from you. Sure. Uh, so a lot of questions in there. I'll try and uh, uh, answer them one by one. Um, it's a very good question about whether uh, the uh, prevalence of pain is increasing uh, over time, um, or are we more attuned or more likely to diagnose pain? At, uh, or is the sort of real prevalence increasing? Um, you know, certainly an important factor which has continued to happen in the context of the pandemic and is a key feature of uh, sort of health and healthcare in Canada is that our population is aging and there's a higher incidence of chronic pain in older people. Um, and so you know, that is a, our sort of slow, uh, you know, slow and sometimes fast moving uh, driver of, uh, of chronic pain. Uh, in Canada and something that we can continue to expect uh, to increase over time over the next years and, and decades. Um, so uh, it, it only tells that we need more and more attention to appropriate management uh, uh, and safe and effective management of chronic pain. Um, I, uh, so there's a, there's, a, there's a very good question as to what the experience of chronic pain uh, has been like in the context of the pandemic. Uh, we, we don't have a lot of empirical data about that yet. There's a lot of people um, who are, are, are studying that. I'm involved in one study that's examining the experience of uh, chronic pain in the context of COVID-19. Um, you know, there's uh, sort of, I'll, I'll mention sort of two factors. Uh, one is that uh, as we have all experienced, um, uh, there's a very strong and important and sustained psychological repercussions. Uh, from, uh, from the pandemic. And we know, as we've talked about quite extensively already, uh, that our psychological state very much affects our experience of chronic pain and our, our need and our ability to, to seek care. Uh, so that's a really important part of what the sort of chronic pain experience uh, in the pandemic uh, has been. Uh, another important one is, uh, is isolation, uh, uh, which has uh, a variety of implications. Uh, virtual care in some ways has helped to uh, bridge the gap, uh, but we have a very uh, important and significant uh, digital divide. Monica had mentioned earlier uh, in her case uh, about uh, um, uh, the woman living in a rural area. Um, and uh, even in urban areas, we have a digital divide of people, certain kinds of people being able to access uh, virtual care and others not being able to. And so, uh, you know, vir virtual care is important. It's been an important uh, move forward in healthcare in general uh, and specifically in chronic pain. Um, uh, but uh, we need to be attentive to who that's benefiting and who that's not benefiting. Uh, the last comment I'll make is with respect to uh, opioid use. We have reports from across the country um, that uh, opioid related harms, including overdose and overdose deaths have increased significantly in the context of the pandemic. However, there's significant regional variability. So uh, it seems that the highest incidences of uh, overdose death increases have been in British Columbia, Alberta, and Ontario. Uh, but for example, the Eastern provinces actually, uh, the year to date, if you compare um, uh, January to September 2020 to January to September 2019, uh, there have been fewer overdose deaths uh, in provinces like Nova Scotia. Um, so th there have been important regional differences uh, and it's important for us, there have been different health system responses in, those, in, in the various provinces, which may be con contributing to the differences across the country. May I just make a, a point just to follow up on Abby's point? Um, Abby, you mentioned sort of the growing sort of um, chronic pain and perhaps the elderly population. I want to sort of bring that back to the sort of early uh, mid-year population. So women who are 45 to 54, we're actually seeing an increase in death rates, cardiac death rates in that group. And there is a biology to that in, in that we're learning so I think it is probably, a, a, you know, you make a good point about is it an increase in prevalence or diagnosis? And, and I think it may be a little bit about both, but these women develop 
artery disease a bit differently than men. So that is a bio biological difference. They're presenting with acute pain, but they're all actually living with chronic pain. So this is a new group that I think we're seeing um, living with this chronic pain across the lifespan. Um, you know, their pain is different than the typical pain that we're used to seeing in cardiac patients. It's described as shortness of breath and neck or shoulder pain, but they still have the same sort of chronicity to their pain. They still have the same, you know, mental health um, links that go with their pain, you know, the depression and the anxiety of living with chronic pain. Um, so I, I think we need to sort of also focus on sort of that, that evolving or emerging group that may be living for a longer duration across the lifespan with more chronic pain. Thanks, Monica. So it's, it's clear from our discussion that chronic pain has such a substantial impact on, on the individual, um, on, on their families and, and on our society, on Canadians as a whole. Um, and so we circled, we've talked a little bit about management strategies, but I'm curious to hear from all of you, you know, what's, what's the next big thing? What's the next innovation? What do you think is at the forefront of science? Or what do you think is at the, you know, like beginnings of uh, the direction of, of clinical practice at its, at its best? I can uh, jump in with that. I, I think we've actually heard some of them. Um, as Avi was saying, the interprofessional care that's being developed now, that's being rolled out and made available to people. I think that this is really something that is making a difference in people's lives and we're seeing this now. And we, you know, we, we're training our students, our professional trainees in this way, we're bringing them together to try and come up with better strategies and better approaches to treat pain. I think that's something that a lot of people are benefiting from. Um, in terms of, I have maybe three categories. Uh, in terms of um, say preclinical development, touching on some of the aspects that Monica was saying too, that, um, you know, what brings patients into the clinic, you know, it's, and Abby was saying the same is that it's suffering. Um, it's not just, you know, being poked, it's not an acute sensation, is that this is something that's actually affecting behavior, it's affecting quality of life. And there's been a resurgence uh, in preclinical studies right now trying to capture this aspect of it so that when we're not, we're not just looking at acute sensations, we're looking at effects of or how to treat the effects of pain on much larger, more holistic views of it. How can we restore normal functioning animals? I think that this is something, or in the preclinical studies, I think this is something that's really going to make a big difference uh, in terms of development. And I guess more in the future, uh, innovation. Um, so this is one of the aspects that's exciting about being at the University of Toronto. You get to see this innovation across the front. I mean, Toronto is a leader. The research at Toronto is leading the world in a lot of aspects. And we're seeing being uh, artificial intelligence assisted predictive medicine. Um, we're seeing advances in a field called synthetic biology, which allows us to make basically custom biologicals on demand. Um, we're seeing nanotechnology and nanoparticles being used to better target medications um, to sites of disease or to sites of, sites of disorder to reduce um, side effects. Uh, rapid genetic testing, we're looking into um, biomarker identification. And when we can think of a way to bring all of these ideas together to develop pain treatments, I think now we're bringing the biological side up to where we're seeing um, sort of the more clinical side, where we're seeing this interdisciplinary uh, treatment. If we can now bring this same interdisciplinary approach um, from another direction uh, in terms of different treatment approaches, we should be able to make, hopefully able to make now much more customized um, personalized treatments for patients. So this is looking into the future, but it is within the realm of possibility. It's something that if we can hopefully just bring this together um, as a community, I think that we're gonna see some very exciting things, uh, hopefully within our lifetime so that we're not, you know, we don't have to rely on this heavy hammer mm -hmm. of non-specific drugs anymore or the old class of drugs. And you know, we might be able to move into sort of the next generation or next and next generation of treatments. I, I think that it's a very exciting frontier. I guess I can chime in from a clinical perspective. Um, we know that digital health is on the rise. You know, in 2018, 1% of Canadians subscribe to mobile or internet services. So I certainly think a way forward is to harness these technologies to include 
tailored multimodal strategies for pain management. And I think the technologies will need to address both sex and gender differences in pain management. And I also think it's absolutely essential that we have the voice of the patient on our research teams. I mean, Canada has shifted our focus in research to address the two death valleys, and we've discussed these already during this evening. Uh, one of them is sort of mobilizing the results of biomedical research, but the second is how can we actually get these technologies into clinical practice settings? Um, the UK and the US have pioneered this work, and in Canada, I think we're starting to shift our gears to have patients uh, work with us on research teams, be part of the solution to pain management. Um, so that's one comment. Um, I think we also need to put um, effort or continue our efforts in looking at Indigenous communities and racialized populations in Canada. Um, intergenerational cycles show there is a high prevalence of chronic pain in Indigenous populations. Um, and there are, you know, cultural differences in terms of discussing pain or su suppressing pain behaviors. Um, some of the scales, scales that we use, like the numeric rating scales may not work so well in, in other sort of um, communities. Uh, so I think that should be a, a focus. Um, and um, I guess one plug is to continue to engage women as participants in our research and to you know, disaggregate our data by, by, by sex and or gender so that we can actually start to describe and, and really utilize differences between our sexes and genders in some of our treatment modalities. Um, so that's just a comment from a clinical perspective. Thanks, Debbie. I'll give you a chance to, to weigh in here on what you think is the, the next big thing, what's at the forefront. Uh, and probably, probably no surprise to hear this from me, but I, I, I think our biggest uh, opportunity is health system integration. Uh, you know, the, for, exa uh, for example, you know, the vast majority of chronic pain care uh, is delivered by uh, in, in primary care settings, for example, in your family doctor's offices. Uh, but those aren't the places that are very well resourced to be able to deliver uh, uh, effective chronic pain therapies. Um, you know, Dr. Fiona Campbell, who's also part of the UTCSP, is the co-chair of the Canadian Pain Task Force. And one of their, uh, you know, what I found to be one of their most illuminating findings that the, the purpose of, of, the, of the task force is really to identify sort of health system strategies for chronic pain across the country is that uh, the way we have set up our care for chronic pain uh, varies substantially from province to province. So it's really very contingent. It's not uh, really responsive to the nature uh, of chronic pain. So for example, in British Columbia, they have a very strong primary care approach to managing chronic pain. In Ontario, we have a much more top heavy tertiary level, you know, hospital-based approach uh, to chronic pain. Uh, there's no reason uh, that we can't have, you know, we, we, can't, we can't marry those two approaches and have both because we do need uh, access uh, at all levels and integrating that access across levels. Um, you know, if we take a, a, a comparator like, um, you know, diabetes or high blood pressure, we have, you know, province-wide um, uh, approaches uh, and strategies for the management of these very important and very prevalent diseases. Uh, we do not yet in many, most provinces, uh, definitely not in Ontario, have what we can call a substantial province-wide strategy for managing chronic pain. Uh, you know, even at the clinical level in terms of synthesizing knowledge, uh, and this is not just a Canadian issue, this is an international issue, uh, but I'll, I'll give the example of Canada. You know, in 2017, we had the release of uh, guidelines for the use of opioids in the management of chronic pain but we still have not had uh, guidelines just for the management of chronic pain. Uh, so we have really prioritized very particular areas of management without thinking about uh, uh, and providing good guidance and support for uh, chronic pain at a, at a health system level to support individual practitioners and therefore individual patients. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. 
uh, I think what we've heard here is that it's, it's an exciting time. There's still a lot of work to be done, but for me, that's, that's exciting. That's motivating. I think we've got some directions that we can really launch off of. It's an exciting time to be in pain research. It's an exciting time to be in clinical practice around pain. And I think it's, it's an exciting time to be at U of T and being part of the University of Toronto Center for the Study of Pain, where we bring these voices together um, and we together work on this complex problem. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. I'm inviting your questions now. I can see from our question and answer that we have over 100 questions, so thank you. Um, we had over 100 sent to us before this seminar, so over 200 questions to pick from. I'm gonna take a look at the chat and we'll throw some of them out there to get a little bit more perspective from our panelists. So the first question uh, that we'll pose today is, is talking about this multidisciplinary approach to chronic pain management. So the question is, uh, what other disciplines do you see could come to the table in the fight against chronic pain? So who's coming to the table and, and who has yet to be invited? So in your opinion, who else needs to be a part of the discussion or who else are you working with? Um, maybe one aspect that's been mentioned a few times about the psychological impacts of chronic pain. Uh, we do know from working within the university in terms of our training for um, trainees, uh, there are some disciplines that I think could benefit as well to be more brought tightly into the circle being um, psychology and psychiatry um, to, so that they, these other disciplines get a better understanding as well about um, pain training. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on this subject. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with that. So a couple pieces of research that I've been working on have been looking at the historical patterns of uh, chronic pain care. And what we saw early on in the early 1980s with this more biopsychosocial approach to uh, chronic pain, that the, the research and development was really dominated by two areas. One was uh, you know, psychology and psychiatry, and the other was rehabilitation. And uh, likewise, uh, we, did a, we did a review looking at you know, 95 different approaches to multidisciplinary care for chronic pain and also opioid dose reduction. And we looked at you know, who were the key players in uh, those multidisciplinary teams. And what we found consistently were uh, really four professions. This is not to be exclusive, but uh, just to identify who were the most commonly um, uh, uh, included professions were uh, psychology, uh, nursing, uh, uh, physical therapy and, and medicine. Um, and then those are very important roles also for occupational therapy um, and, and, and many other professions, uh, but just identifying sort of historically who had been sort of the key players in, in making multidisciplinary care uh, available for the management of chronic pain. And what we saw was, uh, you know, that early dominance from re rehabilitation medicine and, um, uh, and psychology then started to be taken over first by uh, anesthesiology and neurology. So from both of the medical fields and then later on to sort of general internal medicine. Uh, and that sort of came with the flow of more and more uh, uh, biological or biomedical approaches, including opioids for the management of chronic pain. So if we're trying to move more towards uh, a biopsychosocial approach, I think we, it's very important for us to prioritize uh, these other professions who have that as really uh, an in, in, integral part of their training and their approach to care. I might, I might just add that um, uh, including the patients as part of our care teams now, our research teams, so we can learn <laughs> what matters most to the patients and, and work together. So I'll, I'll just throw that in there too. Thank you. So I, I think it's important to recognize, you know, who is effect, who is at the table and who is effective at the table, but then who isn't and, and giving opportunities. This is something that we're always thinking about at the UTCSP in terms of um, our education initiatives, which faculties, which disciplines are we providing this education for and where are there opportunities to grow? Um, because with that, you know, you can really innovate when you're bringing in different perspectives. So that's just another comment. Building on that, question number two was um, 
understanding kind of the healthcare perspective or the, the health system perspective. So does the multidisciplinary approach cost the province more money? And is that why prescribing opioids is preferred? I guess I'll take that question. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, we have to think about, uh, uh, you know, cost, but we also have to think about uh, cost effectiveness. Um, and uh, that, that's an important gap in our research. Uh, a lot of, uh, we, we seem to be in terms of chronic pain um, uh, research very much focused on sort of efficacy and implementation. And there's an important area of uh, cost effectiveness. However, uh, there have been studies looking at cost effectiveness for multidisciplinary care. Uh, these are the ones that I'm familiar with, at least are a little bit more historical, but have demonstrated um, a good benefit because we have to look at uh, costs in total. So for example, if a, a, a biopsychosocial or multimodal or multidisciplinary or interprofessional approach to chronic pain, for example, is able to uh, help someone get back to work, uh, and earn an income and, and be, uh, uh, you know, be able to be uh, uh, interacting with their family and supporting their family and supporting their society, we have to think about those kinds of costs and those kinds of cost benefits uh, that may result, which are, you know, can happen also with medications, uh, but are much more likely to happen with uh, a more multidisciplinary approach uh, to pain. And likewise, I'll, I'll also add that, uh, you know, we, uh, if we want to pick, keep picking on opioids, uh, we actually don't have ev evidence, forget about cost effectiveness, we don't have evidence for clinical effectiveness of opioids for the long-term management of chronic pain. Um, uh, in, in fact, other uh, therapeutics, including things like uh, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, have shown better long-term efficacy or effectiveness than um, uh, than opioids have. So it's hard to actually make a claim for cost effectiveness for opioids when uh, it's unclear whether they actually are in, when we look at it from a, a, a clinical trials perspective, so a population perspective, uh, that they are actually effective for managing chronic pain. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we're coming to the close of the webinar. Uh, there are so many great questions as I'm sifting through. I wish we had time for all of these. I think it really speaks to how um, important this question, of uh, this, this topic around managing chronic pain really is and managing pain. Um, and I think it really spurs an opportunity to, for us to continue this dialogue in different ways. So I'm going to leave the panelists with a, a final question, and that is, what are the key takeaways from your work, your research, your field that you wish everyone with chronic pain knows about? Maybe I'll start here. Um, so as mentioned, I'm a preclinical scientist. We study mostly the biology of pain. We're looking at mechanisms by which chronic pain can occur and what factors contribute to that. Um, you know, how does uh, gender, how does sex contribute to pain? These kinds of questions. Um, but one thing that's actually very important in our work though, um, you know, when we're trying to investigate how pain actually occurs is that there doesn't always have to, pain is a very individualized experience. I mean, this is, I think, the crux of a lot of difficulty in translating research from bench to bedside. I think that it's very difficult to capture that. So yes, everyone will have a different pain experience. Um, you know, even though an injury is healed, there's no sign of trauma, for example, yes, there can still certainly be pain. And I think that this is something that's actually extremely important we, you know, it's something that we need to keep in mind. It's something that I just kind of would, I would affirm to a lot of patients out there that this is very, that it is your experience, that it is um, very meaningful. And I just encourage everyone out there to uh, continue to work with the resources available. Um, yeah, and, you know, don't doubt yourself. Thanks, Mom. I mean, I can add in from a clinical perspective and probably there's a lot of overlaps, I think, with the preclinical, but 
I think the sex and gender differences, the subjective nature of pain, and just the importance of a proper pain assessment uh, to guide management strategies. Um, if, we, if we aren't really assessing pain properly, um, you know, across, across uh, ethnicities, um, age groups, um, sex and gender, then we can't really develop an appropriate management plan. So I think it's really sort of back to basis and really um, basics and really keeping in mind that a one size doesn't fit all because it is a subjective experience as Rob said. Uh, I, I would say if you allow me two things, one is, uh, uh, and I'll build on what Monica and Rob just said, that because pain is subjective, that uh, it's important for us to uh, have a, a, a very good dose of empathy for those uh, people who are living with chronic pain. Uh, it can be very hard uh, to see. They may appear well. Uh, they may appear like uh, like the rest of us, but indeed maybe uh, maybe suffering inside. Um, the the invisibility of pain uh, can be very challenging for people to live with, and the difficulty for other people understanding what their pain uh, is, is like can be very challenging. Um, and the second thing is, though there are uh, important risk factors for pain, uh, for chronic pain specifically, anybody can experience it. Um, so uh, uh, do, do as much as you can to be prepared, um, you know, in terms of uh, trying to live a good lifestyle, eat well, sleep well, meditate, exercise, uh, do those things that you can do that are going to benefit you anyway, regardless of whether you're going to develop chronic pain, they'll help you from any other diseases, but can put you in good stead. Uh, if you if you do encounter a situation where uh, there may be the beginnings of uh, of chronic pain. Thank you. Thank you to each and every one of you and to all of you for joining us. Um, and if you're living with chronic pain, we really hope that you feel some optimism coming out of this session, uh, knowing that there's an army of researchers and clinicians at the university who really care about this problem and who are really passionately seeking out the answers um, and really focused on understanding pain and the delivery of pain management support. And for everyone, as I mentioned earlier, it, it takes a village. And so if the topic of pain discovery and innovation speak to you, uh, there's many places for you to plug in. And if you'd like to be more connected to the work of the University of Toronto Center for the Study of Pain, the UTCSP, or if you want to be involved in supporting our work in other ways, we would love to hear from you. Uh, you will receive a post-event survey very shortly. Uh, we welcome your feedback. It helps our alumni team really understand uh, what topics are of interest to you and would be of value to you. Uh, additionally, in that link, there will be a link to this webinar so you can watch it. So some of the questions were, you know, can you explain this to me again or can you repeat what you said? Uh, you can find that information there. You can rewatch it and share it with others and we encourage you to do that. So thank you so much again. Stay healthy and safe, everyone. Good evening.